Thank you, Ambassador Vishwanathan. And uh, very briefly, I'm chairman of the Research and Information System. I retired from the Indian Foreign Service about uh, four years ago, and I'm now heading this think tank. I also teach, so I'm an academic. So uh, very briefly, I think the questions are before you, so I'm not going to repeat that. I'm just going to make, if you allow me, um, three or four propositions which uh, can uh, serve as the setting for discussing the specific questions which have been put forward. I also want to thank the ORF for uh, joining hands with RAS and doing this. I think it's great that uh, both think tanks are doing this. So my first proposition is that uh, I think while multipolarity has increased in the world of late, multilateralism has diminished. And this is interesting, just by way of a proposition. The world has certainly become much more multipolar compared to 10, 20 years ago. But um, instead of the logical outcome, which should have been that multilateralism should have strengthened so that multipolarity can find expression. Instead, what we are seeing, and I think this has been seen particularly in the context of COVID, multilateralism has declined. Now, there are, of course, drawbacks of multilateralism. The UN is the, is the most classic example of how, especially the Security Council, which is, I think, completely out of sync with contemporary reality, contemporary power, and even the basic democratic deficit that you see in the UN Security Council is quite shocking, at least for me. Now, on the other hand, other organizations are struggling and I won't be surprised if a couple of them try to change course. In that category, I would put WTO and WHO, the World Trade Organization and the World Health Organization. I think both organizations are trying very hard, I would say, to get their aura back. Whether they succeed or not, I don't know, but efforts are being made. So. There is, there is no doubt that multilateralism has declined. When it comes to multipolarity, I also want to make another proposition, which is economically the world is multipolar, but security wise, I don't see the world as being greatly multipolar, frankly. So it is only economically that the world has become multipolar, for sure. But if you look at security, the military expenditure, the military strength, I don't think the world has become that much multipolar, frankly. There will be uh, United States at the top of the pyramid, and I suspect the first three, four ranks may be taken by the United States. So frankly, on in that area, security and military, I'm not sure the world is multipolar at all. Plurilateralism, yes, definitely. I think there is an attempt uh, to 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 have more and more plurilateral groupings. To a great extent, the resident powers of the UN Security Council will have to take responsibility for the proliferation of plurilateralism. What do you expect a country like India to do? If you're not going to give me a seat at the high table, naturally I will find a place where I can do business, frankly. So uh, I think you really can't object to plurilateralism to great extent I think the plurilateral wave was um, inaugurated by the advent of G20. For me, that is the starting point in the advent of the financial crisis. From then on, we have seen a number of groupings, including, of course, the BRICS. The problem with plurilateralism, though, is I think there is a difference between competitive plurilateralism and cohesive plurilateralism. So if the plurilateral groupings are consistent with each other, and they have a common objective and they are cohesive. That is one thing, but I don't see it that way. Many of the plurilateral groupings, I would say, are actually working either consciously or subconsciously at cross purposes. So we can talk about that as well. And that to me is a, is a problem, frankly, um, because if you if, if you're going to have exclusive plurilateral groupings, then that leads to a different kind of dynamic. Again, I would put the blame on the resident stakeholders of multilateralism, the people in the UN Security Council who are permanent members and who should be doing much more. I, I would really blame them first and foremost. And um, finally, I also think we are going through this uh, era 
of what I call competitive plurilateralism because the world is also in transition. Uh, one of the things is that we haven't, uh, we, are, we are yet to see a settled multipolar world order. What we see is a few poles, obviously, coming here and there, but there are a lot of undefined poles. So you can argue, for example, that US and uh, China are uh, certainly, um, uh, you, uh, you, can, you can argue that US and China are poles, you can argue EU is a pole, I'm not so sure about the others. That is the problem. So you have a number of other countries. Where do you put them? If they are not uh, really singularly capable of being a pole, they will obviously um, put their forces together and form plurilateral groupings. To me, that is uh, the way in which things are going. I will stop there because that's not the purpose to hear the chairman, but I just thought I'll put forward these propositions. I think the questions uh, for this session are very, very specific. I, I think you really have to address whether really there is voice for people who participate, who are not who are not there, and are these effective? The, the point is existing structures, are they effective? That is really the question. I will begin uh, uh, with Professor Silva, De Silva from Brazil, if she is still there, and I will follow it up with Dr. Tanya. And then we will have Anirudh Shingal, if that's OK. I, Sir De Silva, yes. Yes, madam, if you can unmute yourself. May I begin? Yes, please. OK, sorry, because I had some problems with my microphone. Yeah, OK. Well, um, I will uh, do a presentation in the themes of the correct international monetary and financial governance and the role of the BRICS countries on that. Uh, in the years following the international financial crisis in September 2008, it became clear that the institution responsible for global financial governance has failed to promote stability and implemented the reform discussed and approved in the group of G20, as we know. What was the problem is to give more representation to the emerging economies in developing countries. These factors have contributed to the decisions of the BRICS nations to create the new development bank, NDB, and also the fund known as Contingent, contingent Reserve and uh, Arrangement, a CRA. These initiatives were designed in 2012 and introduced in the 2014, with functions similar to those of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, IMF, respectively. Some analysts received the creations of NDB and CRA with some skepticism regarding their ability to make a difference as complementary mechanism of existing financial systems. Other so this initiative not only as concrete actions to build the BRICS joint financial architecture, but also as an important step establishing New financial, new international financing instruments in the face of the huge infrastructure investment shortage. And strengthening strengthen the global network of financial protection. In addition, other analysts stated that these institutions could compete with World Bank and the IMF in the future. But it's important to say, uh, it's important to highlight, these events have been added uh, to the ongoing discussion on the international monetary and financial order. Professor Eichengreen asks in one of his articles written uh, for the European Central Bank, I think uh, two years ago, uh, 
uh, whether there is an international order. And if so, what this international order would be. And he says, all the generations of economists distinguished the international monetary system of Bretton Woods era from the international monetary no system of the subsequent period, of course. And he adds, they try to distinguish global monetary order for global monetary disorder. And to point which terms best captures the current state of affairs. It's uh, just uh, uh, to note that Professor Eichen Green defines order as an arrangement of items related to one another according to a particular sequence, pattern, or method. The most obvious metric on which to go uh, the performance of monetary order is its success in delivering price stability. Then we can, he argues that the current international monetary and financial architecture displays elements of both order and disorder. For example, we can see elements of order in the exchange rate arrangements operated by different countries. However, we can also see elements of disorder. Uh, it means a confused or disorganized state. For example, the management of capital uh, flows, the provisions of international liquidity, and the global safety net cobbled to get out of multilateral, regional, and bilateral arrangements. That said, from my point of view, it was the elements of disorder that most influenced the creation of NDB and CRA. These institutions were the concrete response of the BRICS countries to their financial instability, in addition to the disproportionate representations and the lack of a voice for emerging power in the IMF and World Bank. If it is fine, it is true. It leads me to answer the first question negatively on item two of our agenda. And so the question is, is the great multilateralism system sufficient in addition to plurilateral arrangements? In short, my answer is no. In the field of multilateralism, for example, the creation of NDB makes evident the desire of the founding countries to establish new performance standards for this multilateral financing instrument. The book was idealized by British countries in order to differentiate itself from post-Second World War financial institutions, meaning that it sought to differentiate itself from the World Bank with respect to mandate, modus operandi, governance, and the decision-making structure of the time. These motivations can be found in the bank's articles of agreement. I think we no. Professor, this, uh, Silva, Professor Silva, okay. may I request you to conclude in two minutes? Thank you. Yes, yes I will do that. Okay. Uh, then what are the challenges? Then I will jump to the challenges. What are the challenges? And to be, for example, I'm talking about NDB because it's our uh, common financial instrument to finance uh, development. Uh, what are the challenges? Can NDB help BRICS influence and lead change with existence uh, multilateral financial institution? The answer depends on the range of factors. The first is the scale of operations. The second is uh, distribution of lands among the BRICS countries, including those are in the situation of fiscal restrictions and unable to provide sovereign guarantees. 
and boldly embrace the financial 2030 agenda. And finally, um, to establish some corporations uh, among founding countries in the other countries, in the banks, uh, but always considering the developing countries' perspectives. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor De Silva. Can I now turn to Dr. Tanya? And if you can take five to seven minutes, max, that way we can have more time for discussion. I will then call on Dr. Shingal after that. Dr. Tanya, you have the floor. Yeah, okay, no problem. Thanks for Chairman to propose so many interesting questions and thank you for the colleagues to share all the interesting ideas. I, I Because my major is, is economics, so I would like to talk about trade in the view of multilateralism. Uh, and my speaking will uh, have three uh, small parts. The first, I will sh uh, share my understanding of multilateralism in international trade. And second, I will uh, share about my understanding of the challenges in the current multilateral trade system. And then I would propose some uh, advice about how we are going to continue with multilateralism in terms of international trade. First, about the current situation of multilateralism in terms of trade, I would like to use the description of Professor Richard Baldwin as a two-pillar structure of world, uh, world Trade Organization, that is WTO, and a variety of preferential, uh, preferential uh, trade agreements, that is uh, PTAs. So it's a two-pillar structure of the two. As reported by the World Bank, every major nation is actually now a member of the World Trade Organization, what we call the WTO, and so a participant in its complex process of multilateral trade liberalization. Uh, as I calculated, an average WTO member also belongs to at least 10 PTAs at the same time. While WTO governs the traditional rules uh, about uh, among trade partners, PDAs act as a rapid adaption to the changing of the fashion of international trade. Because WTO it, sometimes is hard for it to change very rapidly uh, about all the rules and all the agreements. And uh, in terms of uh, whether the current multilateral trade system is sufficient, my answer is similar to other speakers. The answer is currently no, but it's not so pessimistic because I also think that our way to multilateralism in terms of trade is basically okay, only with a little problems. Well, first, uh, I would like to say there are three main challenges to achieving a sufficient multilateral trade system. First is the rising of emerging trade giants, uh, just like our members in the BRICS. Clearly, not all countries welcome powerful trade partners. We could observe exclusion of emerging markets in several mega regional trade agreements which is not a good arrangement for multilateralism, as we agree. Second is the rising of, uh, of offshoring and the, the rapid developing of global value chain. Specifically, the offshoring from high tech nations and the rich nations to low wage nations requires new rules, not about tariffs. A tariff is the traditional way we, um, we just to uh, rule the trade, but now we need more rules about the protection of investments and also the protection of intellectual property. Such needs tend to be met by PTAs, but not very sufficient in my point of view. Third is the current complex role of trade system. As in a, in a view of economics, the trade is trade. It's a win-win cooperation, but uh, the trade in real economy is more like a complex of economy, political 
uh, issues. As we have observed, some countries treat trade uh, tra trade agreements, uh, that is, um, uh, our, uh, some like mm, P PTT, uh, such like this, as a favor to political partners or as a measure to retain privileges in the, globe, in the global society, not as a win-win outcome of free economic negotiation. This is actually the real native of, of uh, these uh, trade agreements, right? It's a win-win outcome of economic negotiation, which is free and equal. This, I should say, is not a true multilateralism, and later I will show more about this. Uh, and second, I would like to share my opinion about how we continue with multilateralism in the future, and this may answer some of the questions raised by the chairman. Uh, well, I would like to share some theoretical findings of researchers, of economists. Research papers such as Saji and uh, Yodis 2010, uh, Josic and Moella Longer 2020, find that even when the endowment of nations have large gaps in the model, the existence of a multilateral trade agreement is always necessary for the stability of the trade system, and that the formation of PTAs is always necessary for achieving global free trade. That, that means that car, our current trend of forming more and more PDAs is actually a right way toward multilateralism and toward global free trade. But here is the problem that is I want to emphasize is that we need to emphasize the free to pursue PTAs. That means in the process of forming PTAs, there is no compulsory. There are no picky things. Um, it means every participant in PTAs should have a voice on the table of negotiation and should have sufficient freedom in pursuing new trade agreements. This is also the reason why I call an exclusive and an equal multilateralism as a not true one, uh, more like a false one or a fake one. Finally, I, uh, well, I believe that the current situation caused by COVID-19 and global slowdown will be reversed if we want to sit down on the table to negotiate with each other uh, with a view of multilateralism. I, I think everything will be better and better, especially for powerful countries. Um, powerful countries should understand the issues at stake and rekindle with cooperative spirits uh, may not continue with some of the actions currently uh, undergoing. Yeah, this is my point of view. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tanya. That's very interesting. I, I have a bit of a trade background and if there is a time uh, towards the end for discussions, I will take you up on some of those issues. Dr. Oh, yes. Shingle, okay. you, thank you. Dr. Shingle, you have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kumar. Uh, I'd like to thank Akshay for, uh, for the invitation, for having me here. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm global, global challenges, global problems, global crises call for uh, coordinated policy action at the international level. This led to the birth of the United Nations and then, of course, the IMF and the World Bank uh, after the Second World War to promote international political stability, financial stability, and then to aid the post-war uh, development and reconstruction work, right? Now, uh, things have moved on since then. While the roles of these organizations have expanded, uh, their governance structure is not very really in sync with uh, the changing realities on the ground, right? So there is tacit acceptance, for instance, that uh, the person who heads the World Bank is going to be from the US. The IMF, on the other hand, will have its chief coming from the European Union. But even the, you know, the voting rights there are not really reflective of the realities on the ground. So clearly things, uh, things need to evolve and they haven't evolved. The other attempt at multilateralism, if you will, was the stillborn international trade organization, which eventually paved the way for the World Trade Organization in 1995. And uh, I'd like to argue that at least at the beginning, to begin with, uh, 
the W2 achieved a fair amount of success in uh, tariffing quotas, in getting tariffs down, especially on manufactured products, in removing a slew of non-tariff barriers. Uh, but then I think with the onset of the Doha development round, the development agenda, there was a stalemate. Now, uh, having said that, uh, I think one should laud the WTO for being an organization where uh, there has been more inclusivity where every where the principle of reverse consensus means that every member state has had a role in decision making. Uh, this of course this of course has also been a double edged sword, right? So uh, you know countries were not able to get to an agreement in Doha in 2001, and uh, unfortunately the system stalled since then. And the only success, if you will, that the WTO has had since then and that to happen, you know after a period of about 15, 16 years was the trade facilitation agreement that was agreed to in 2018. Now, one fallout of this has been the rise of plurilateralism, right, uh, which my colleague from China has already spoken about. Uh, but it's, it's, it's interesting to see the way uh, plurilateral trade agreements have also evolved, right? So completely in sync with the growth, of, with the coming in of age of the WTO in 1995, there has been uh, a consistent rise in the proliferation of trade agreements. Uh, of course, the earliest ones were, uh, you know, the, the Master's Treaty itself, which led to the formation of the European Union, and then the NAFTA and its re recent reincarnation, the, uh, the USMCA, right? But uh, recently what has happened is that countries are now negotiating more and more mega trade deals. So the, the DPP, which after the uh, pullout of the US led to the CPTPP, uh, and more recently, uh, the the RCEP, right, which came into being uh, last year, which was signed on November 15, 2020, and which unfortunately India pulled out from at the very last minute. Uh, the other, uh, meanwhile, the EU has also negotiated uh, mega deals with, with Canada, with Japan, with Australia, New Zealand. So uh, there has been a plethora of trade agreements that have been negotiated amongst trading partners and which kind of have deviated from multilateralism, if you will. So a lot of trade now uh, is is uh, being carried out under disciplines that are not multilateral anymore. And the uh, the RCEP and uh, the CPTPP in particular uh, have been negotiated amongst countries which account for more than a third of the world's population and cover at least 40 percent of global trade in goods and services. Uh, of course, at one point of time, there was probably uh, a greater chance of an agreement being negotiated between the US and the EU in the form of the TTIP, uh, though that's now been on the back burner uh, since the Trump regime. Uh, so in, in a way, it has been a mixed bag as far as the W2 is concerned, uh, uh, and things of late and have, have actually been more towards, towards plurilateralism. Uh, clearly, this also shows signs of there being vested interests. Uh, in the previous session, Akshay and amongst and and uh, our colleague from Brazil also spoke about um, uh, the role that multinationals have have had. Uh, and uh, you know, it, this is something that should not be slighted, given that uh, almost 60% of international trade is now trade in intermediates, and a lot of this is actually trade that happens between multinational enterprises. The other good instance or illustration of this is uh, the role of technology, right? Now, uh, the influence that tech giants in the US, for instance, have had. Uh, and of course, uh, a lot and a lot of people have also argued that the trade war in 2019 was not really a trade war, but a technology war, you know, uh, and uh, uh, it clearly aimed at Huawei and other tech firms in China, for instance. So there is there is clear, clear evidence of there being vested interests. Uh, which have thwarted efforts at multilateralism. Um, having said that, uh, if you think about the system being more inclusive, I think probably the only uh, organization that is trying to do that or has tried to do that has been the WTO through its dispute settlement system, for instance, which is kind of the jewel in the crown. Though, of course, uh, uh, what happened with the US uh, in 2019 and 2020 uh, about the appointment of the, of the judges, again, uh, has taken the system to ransom. Uh, the other, you know, in addition to the IMF, the World Bank, the WTO. If you, if you can conclude in two minutes, thanks. Yes, I will. Yes, I will. So I think the, the other major attempt at multilateralism has been in terms of climate change. 
uh, with the UNFCCC and uh, you know the, the the Paris Accord, where again though, uh, you know, with the U.S. under the Trump administration reneging on its commitments, uh, that threw a spanner in the wheels. Though of course now the Biden um, administration is trying to salvage that situation somehow. Uh, and of course, very recently now, and again, a lot of the, our colleagues here on the panel have already alluded to this, is the COVID crisis, uh, which uh, should actually have been a, a great opportunity for multilateralism to work. It's a huge global crisis which calls for a coordinated policy response. Unfortunately, what we've seen so far has been uh, economic nationalism, uh, both in terms of vaccine nationalism uh, and, in, in, and in other ways. Uh, but I think if somehow, uh, you know, the world can get its act together and provide a coordinated policy response to this public health crisis, which is now also becoming an economic crisis, I think there is probably some uh, hope for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to ask uh, Valeria from Russia if she's still there and if she would like to speak for two minutes uh, just on this panel, if she likes. Uh, uh, Mo Mohan, by the way, Valeria is not there. It's uh, Dr. Victoria Panova. I apologize. I apologize profusely, Madam Victoria. So sure, I that's about my first name. So, Dr. Victoria, please, would you like to contribute to this part for two, three minutes, and then we can have a discussion? Thank you. Sure, sure, would happily do that. Um, in fact, I alluded to a number of uh, issues that were also discussed uh, during the session as well, but I think I will go in somewhat more detail. I really liked uh, what the last speaker have talked about with their uh, quite a lot of vested interests that we have in multilateralism and uh, now uh, that we have to uh, deal with those issues within their uh, international institutions that are existent. Uh, we have their um, example of WTO. Uh, there was a, uh, one of the speakers uh, remembered the um, uh, crisis that we have with uh, judges not being appointed. Uh, what uh, the problem is that WTO system seems to be not still working even with the Trump administration gone and Biden. Uh, I know there are some hopes for uh, Biden administration to be much more multilateral, uh, multilateral open, but uh, we're still at the same time uh, witness that uh, it doesn't matter much. Uh, they're just style, uh, the difference of style in the behavior of their uh, different governments, different administrations, but at the same time, uh, there is a particular interest that will be uh, promoted, and WTO is part of that. Uh, and thus, it is particular um, a responsibility for BRICS countries, for example, to be um, uh, to be, uh, in fact, proud and to be uh, devoted uh, to the system and to be able to. Uh, also bringing this into their regional um, um, trade agreements. There was already mentioned RCP. Uh, there is a Eurasian Union, economic union that uh, where Russia is part of, uh, and there are um, other institutions, and we can make a network of such regional um, trade agreements together with uh, the global WTO, which has to be kept um, alive. Um, I could say uh, we had mentions of uh, World Bank, of IMF, of UN. I would like to mention some other areas which were not yet uh, alluded to. For example, we don't have a comprehensive international energy organization. It is one of the important topics. We had a number of issues um, adopted during uh, BRICS chairship last year, but even before, and there is great interest uh, within the energy research platform. Uh, but when we talk about institutions, they either uh, Western prone, uh, like uh, International Energy Agency, which is pro-consumer, but without any um, interest in understanding their issues of Producers and vice versa. There is OPEC or OPEC Plus that is uh, antagonistic in this uh, regard, and we have an international energy forum that is not being being rather talk shop 
uh, but not functioning. So probably BRICS, uh, first with the energy research platform, but uh, probably taking actions in this area could be contributing to multilateralism in each and every air area. Uh, one more point to mention. Uh, we have pandemics and uh, every speaker mentioned health is one of the primary issues of global health governance. And definitely uh, WHO need uh, a boost, I would put it mildly, I will put it diplomatically. And uh, we need, as a BRICS, we need to put our efforts into re-energizing this uh, institution, but also there are a number of other areas where we as BRICS have been taking actions like um, early epidemic response, um, uh, early biological threat response from last year, or the vaccine center from 2018. So uh, we have to be taking comprehensive steps and actions in order to provide for multilateral and uh, inclusiveness in this area, since especially we saw uh, they are, I don't know, third or fourth wave of the pandemic raising. And we have uh, countries that are members of our club, like India or Brazil, that are suffering a lot from the current stage. So uh, we have special responsibility in this regard. And uh, the institutions seem to be not effective. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Victoria. I think a South African wants to pitch in. Request, uh, our friend from South Africa to take the floor, please. Uh, okay. Yes, colleagues, I'm here. I'm just uh, Did you want to struggling. take the floor? Well, uh, not maybe, maybe just to emphasize uh, an area, particularly an area within uh, trade and also an area within um, international development uh, generally. I think that in, in trade, what's important in sort of as momentum sort of grows around this proposal around uh, intellectual property rights. I think what it does reflect is that the systems that as we have them are not functioning and are not necessarily responsive in the way that they could be responsive. Um, I mean, we, 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 we're in this sort of very strange uh, time of the global response to the pandemic where everyone is is where, where it's clear that um, the current structures are not delivering at the pace that they need to be delivering and here you have countries then um, you know like South Africa and India calling for a waiver um, and I think what this really tells you is that is, is that you know it's 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 it 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 in, in the midst of a health crisis, we shouldn't really be having to push so hard uh, for some of these measures uh, in, uh, if this is a unprecedented or a once in a, a hundred year type of an event. Um, but I think anyway, that highlighting those weaknesses, it's important that we continue to push for those longer term reforms so that you do have more responsive uh, systems in place uh, that can deal with the next uh, uh, pandemic, you know, in a way that does not necessarily put um, profits of, of, of multinational companies um, ahead of the health, um, uh, you know, the health needs of uh, populations uh, all over the world. So I think this is something that's going to be quite important. Uh, moving forward. And then I think it's also in terms of just the area of international development. Whilst you do have this uh, conversation around um, uh, 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 developed countries essentially um, being more nationalistic and more interest driven uh, when it comes to international development, I think it's important that uh, countries from the south are not behind the curve in terms of the type of changes that we would like to see in the international development landscape, whether it comes to um, uh, holding, you know, developed countries still accountable for their targets when it comes to international aid, whether it comes to understanding the changing nature of poverty 
uh, and the mere fact that um, you know much of it is taking place in sort of middle-income countries, um, uh, you know, still. Um, so I think there's a whole range of 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 policy areas that have not yet been formed, so solidly formed, in terms of how is it going, what direction it's going uh, beyond the pandemic, that countries such as ours need to be constantly playing a proactive role in shaping, whether it's in the area of intellectual property rights, as, as we're speaking now, or whether it's just in the area of um, just ensuring that you've got more resilient uh, regional value chains. Right. I think these are topics that are important for the post-pandemic era. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm looking for questions. Um, otherwise, I will initiate a discussion myself, but it will, I would much rather have questions from the floor, actually. So if people who haven't spoken and who are expected to be discussants, I, I think it's fair to say that this session, unlike the first session, was dominated by trade, trade investment technology. So if I can look uh, to some questions in that area, please. Anybody? The, uh, I'm assuming, Akshay, that I can go on till 10 minutes past seven. Is that OK? Or will that be too much? Yeah. Uh, yes. yes, please, please go ahead. A question by my colleague, Sabir Sachi. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, it, uh, thank you, sir. It was uh, very interesting to uh, uh, listening to, to all the panelists. Now, I'm in a post uh, pandemic issue that are of importance. Of course, uh, we, we are uh, concentrating on, on uh, some of the uh, ideas, but uh, some of them were already there on the table and we could not deal with them efficiently. And that's why see, we see the challenge at this point, be it uh, development centrality, be it climate justice, or be it uh, the resilience of supply chains, as we are calling it today. Uh, development centrality, if I come to that point, you know, if, uh, and uh, we, we need uh, uh, the views from the panel as to how BRICS can come uh, come forward and help the cause. Because when, as we are talking, as uh, Dr. Pilani rightly mentioned, that post-pandemic, the issues of IPR, as we are dealing with the proposal uh, put forward by India and South Africa on vaccines and why it is not getting through at the WTO, is an important question. But IPR per se is the, the troubles of having a very strict IPR regime and access to technology, cost of technology in developing countries. These are not new. So having the wherewithal of the social capital built around how to deal with IPR issues, what is stopping us today to be more aggressive and what is stopping the world uh, of uh, for uh, towards achieving a solution on this point the second is about uh, issues like food security and it is also pertaining to to the development centrality that we are talking about if we look at india's experience uh, last year the uh, way we could support our poor people by giving uh, them free food grains was through the the provisions of public stockholding of food grains and that that is also part of the development centrality so as we discuss the methods and the modalities and the groupings and 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 the different shades of international actors coming forward it is very important to understand the processes where we are lacking to come towards the issues that we are talking today, be it development centrality, be it climate justice, on which I am not an expert, so I won't comment. But 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 uh, supply chains and development centrality would become even more important as we look at this uh, 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 decade of action on SDGs. Without this, too, none of the functionalities of international groupings would really bear fruit. That is my feeling. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Sabir Sachi. I, I, there isn't enough time, but I, I wish we could have we could have a separate panel discussion on the two issues you raised, both of which the WTO is confronting. One is the TRIPS waiver, uh, which, as you rightly said, India, South Africa are pushing, and the other is the public stockholding uh, uh, decision that we expect from the WTO Agricultural Committee as well. So both are extremely critical. Are there other questions? Uh, on trade investment technology. If not, uh, I have two, uh, not propositions, because I think I've run out of proposition, but maybe two points to make uh, and to conclude uh, if there isn't anything else. 
One is um, what Dr. Tanya said. I was very curious uh, to hear her, and she was, of course, addressing the issue from the point of view of an economist. It is obvious to me that she's a Puritan economist. My view is a, is, is a little bit different in the sense that I have felt one of the serious drawbacks of the WTO was that we blessed all FTAs and PTAs. We shouldn't have done it. Uh, if you go strictly by the WTO law, there are only agreements which are more trade creating than trade diverting, which should have been approved by the Regional Trading Arrangements Committee. Unfortunately, we started with NAFTA. We started with the European Commission. These were big players. We couldn't have said no to them. And since then, what has happened to the multilateral trading system is a massive fragmentation of the system. Half the free trade agreements are neither free nor trade, nor are they agreements, frankly. They cover non-trade issues, they divert trade, and so on. Unfortunately, the WTO, I mean, to date, the WTO has no record of rejecting an FTA. Can you, can you believe it? There are 350 FTAs. Not one FTA or PTA has been rejected by the WTO. So don't tell me all of them are trade creating. It's absurd. That's the first. The second, I think, is what uh, Sabia Sachi mentioned. And, uh, and I regret the fact, and I'm speaking frankly, so I hope my friends in ORF will not mind. I hope my friends in RAS will not mind. But one has to speak free, uh, freely. On the TRIPS waiver, there should have been a BRICS consensus. There is not. And that is distinctly unfortunate in my view. You can argue that there is no consensus on other issues because fine, BRICS is a diverse forum. Each country is for itself. But on an issue like TRIPS waiver, where there is a crying need to uh, for, for justice because there is a real problem. There is a real problem. And there is no BRICS consensus today. It's only India, South Africa, which are pushing it. This is uh, for me personally, and I don't mean to apportion blame. I'm not pointing fingers because at the end of the day, countries have to act in their interest. I understand that. Having spent 36 years in the foreign service, I cannot but understand that. But I think it is singularly unfortunate because the TRIPS agreement, as Andre said it eloquently, this was not an agreement pushed by the members. It was an agreement pushed by the big pharma. It was a big pharmaceutical industry of the United States which pushed for this agreement. It was not negotiated by WTO members. It was imposed on us. That is, it was a very unfair agreement of the Uruguay round. And uh, there is no general exceptions article in the TRIPS agreement. Not many people know this. Both the GATT and the GATS have a general exception, Article 20. The TRIPS agreement is the only agreement in the WTO which does not have general exceptions. They have only limited exceptions. And we struggled. India, Brazil worked very closely, I'm proud to say, in the Doha uh, ministerial. I was one of the Indian negotiators. We worked very closely with Brazil to get the declaration on trips and public health in Doha in 2001. But it was only a ministerial declaration. It was not a law. But now what we are trying to do, India and South Africa, and it's amazing the support we have got from Gordon Brown, Helen Clark, most of the Nobel laureates have supported the waiver. So, and, and I understand yesterday uh, USTR is talking to AstraZeneca and to the Pfizer uh, companies to see what they think of it because something needs to be done, frankly. It will not make a difference to India because we have manufacturing capacity. But what about the countries which don't have manufacturing capacity, which are not able to Use, use the compulsory licenses available as a provision in the TRIPS agreement because there's a lot of pressure on countries not to use compulsory licenses. So I would have thought that on an issue like this, there could have been a solid BRICS, um, shall we say, support. But anyway, that is not to be. But these are some of the issues we can think about. Food security is correct. TRIPS is correct. Technology nationalism, vaccine nationalism. These are the areas where I believe BRICS can contribute if it wants to. Of course, if countries' interests continue to be divergent, then that's a different issue. But I conclude that uh, I still think um, I don't want to end on a pessimistic note. I think there is tremendous value in this forum. There are a lot of things that can be done in this forum, uh, bringing development back, bringing food security back on the agenda. Uh, and uh, this is something we need to work with, try to make the forum 
much more effective through creative out of the box mechanisms. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ambassador Vishwanathan, I hand it back to you. It was a great privilege sharing it with you. I'm just going to hand it back to you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Akshay, as well.